This program contains graphic images and discussion of medical procedures. Viewer discretion is advised. To start with, I wanted to let you know who we are. Um, we're both GYN oncologists, and gynecologic oncologists are physician specialists who have done training in obstetrics and gynecology, and then afterwards we've done additional training in gynecologic oncology where we learn both surgery and chemotherapy, and really gynecologic cancer you'll see over the next few weeks is really multidisciplinary. We work with a lot of colleagues in pathology and radiology, um, in radiation oncology, and so you know it does take extra time to really learn and coordinate this care. We hope to be able to share that experience with you and the role of a GON oncologist in advocating really for women's health um, and this particular need. I think that um, in the sense that our class isn't terribly large, I wanted to get a general sense of who you are because I always think it helps for us to know who's learning and what you want to learn. You know, this is an overview. We've kind of designed a talk tonight that's gonna go over things in general terms, but it's helpful if we know that there's some particular aspect or some interest that you all have so we can tailor some of the later on lectures. So I'll start with a general generic question, which is how many of you in the audience either personally or know someone who has had a gynecologic cancer? Let's raise hands for ovarian cancer. Okay, and how many of you know somebody who's had uterine cancer? One. We're gonna definitely talk about ovarian cancer. We're also gonna talk about uterine cancer and other gynecologic cancers. Um, we think it's important to have a broad overview. Ovarian cancer is clearly um, the disease that causes the most cancer deaths for women in the United States. Internationally, cervical cancer is a more significant disease, and with advanced stage disease, both uterine cancer and cervical cancer um, can take quite a toll. So we hope you don't mind if you indulge us to listen a little bit about um, these other cancers, because I think it will help with early detection, identifying risk factors, and thinking about things that you can do to help decrease the chance of getting cancer and dying from other gynecologic cancers. Uh, tonight will serve as an introduction. Um, next week, we're gonna talk about genetics, and in that, one of our genetic counselors will be joining Dr. Chapman in talking about the genetics of how cancer develops and thinking about hereditary cancer syndromes. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about gynecologic cancer surgery, and Dr. Oeda, Stephanie Oeda, will be joining me um, as we talk about the different techniques, the importance of surgical staging, um, some of the new technologies such as robotics, um, and how that's all rolling into our treatment of gynecologic cancers. We're gonna talk about prevention, um, and in terms of thinking about gynecologic cancer prevention, we know that we can prevent cervical cancer by doing pap smear screening. Dr. Karen Smith McCune will join me and we'll talk about dysplasia, precancers of the cervix. We'll talk about what we understand about ovarian and uterine cancers and things that we can do in terms of prevention um, of disease and also some of the developments in terms of thinking about recurrence. Um, treatment is really gonna be talking about clinical trials and the way that we approach treatment in a combination of multimodality therapy, surgery, chemotherapy, radiation. Dr. Edwin Alvarez in our division is gonna be joining Dr. Chapman, um, and they'll talk about treatment and give you some idea of some of the trials that are currently ongoing and are developing um, really exciting future in GYN oncology. And then our last week, um, we hope to face the future and kind of thinking about the aftermath of all of this treatment. And Dr. Tammy Rowan will be joining us um, to talk about sexual health and survivorship. Um, and some of those conversations, you know, people don't wanna have in, well, people leave the room or it's the end of the conversation. Um, but I think that, you know, in this classroom, hopefully we'll get to know each other well enough by then that we can have some um, conversations that really help with uh, dealing with what happens after people have been treated for cancers um, and the things that we need to continue to think about in terms of ongoing surveillance and monitoring. There are many ribbons that are uh, attributed to different cancers. Um, and while breast cancer is commonly considered a women's cancer, uh, we typically think about our women's cancers being gynecologic cancers. And so, you know, gynecologic cancer is really a, um, 
heterogeneous set of diseases. So, you know, we think about ovarian cancer and we talk about it a lot, um, but we also know that in the United States, more women are going to be diagnosed with uterine cancer than they are with ovarian cancer um, in a single year. It's interesting because the audience has more exposure to ovarian cancer, but like I said, you know, uterine cancer is a serious disease that we can identify early um, and potentially prevent. Cervical cancer uh, is known for being preventable if we do pap smear screening. It's also preventable now as we have vaccinations. And so the idea of an HPV vaccine for cancer prevention is an exciting one as we talk about um, moving cancer, uh, understanding can carcinogenesis into the future. Vulvar cancer and vaginal cancer, we frequently group together with cervical cancer, but our diseases unto themselves, and sometimes it's harder to treat because it's a little bit more complicated in terms of the surgery and the treatment planning. If people want to talk about vaginal cancer or vulvar cancer, let us know. We'll include more of it. Otherwise, our focus is going to be on ovarian, uterine, and cervical cancer. And how many of you knew that you can get a cancer that develops from placental tissue? Has anybody heard of something called a molar pregnancy? Um, that also falls under the purview of gynecologic malignancies. And so we don't want to short shrift gestational trophoblastic tumors or molar pregnancies or choriocarcinoma. But again, that's not going to be the focus of this conversation. But if anybody wants to talk about it, we can think about how to add in some conversation and discussion about that. So today's agenda, we're going to talk about anatomy first. Um, we're going to talk about biology. Um, and then we're going to give a brief overview of ovarian, uterine, and cervical cancers. We'll give you a little quiz at the end, and then we might give you some homework. Um, but nothing bad, uh, just so that there's something that you can read about and think about and, you know, add to it for our future sessions. Um, so I think we're going to start with anatomy. Joss, you want yes. to give it a go? So this is mini medical school, and um, as I was we were preparing these talks together, uh, this talk together, um, thinking back to my medical school days, and um, you know, your first, I, I grew up in a very traditional medical school curriculum. The medical school curriculum has changed very much, but you did, um, you know, 12 weeks of anatomy and histology and spent time in the gross anatomy lab um, and looking under microscope at tissues. Um, and we're gonna show you a little bit of some of that today as it pertains to gynecologic cancers. Um, but. I think it's fair to say Dr. Chen and I are a little bit on the traditional side, so we are going to um, uh, talk about anatomy, and I, I think that you will see it provides a really important framework for understanding where these, um, how these diseases develop and um, what are the important structures that we think about when we are thinking about these cancers. Um, so first is the bony pelvis. So there's uh, several different bones here. Um, this one is, does anybody have any idea what this one is called? It's a crest, it's called the iliac crest. Um, and then the bone that is underneath it is the ilium. So if you feel on your own back, you can feel your iliac crest kind of right um, leading into this part, which is called the sacrum. This entire bone here is called the sacrum. And this is a, called a sacral promontory. Um, and this is actually a important thing for Dr. Chen and I and the rest of the geonocologists um, anatomically in uh, surgery because we actually can see that bony prominence, the sacral promontory, and some of our important pelvic vessels run down the side of the pelvic bone in this direction. Um, this is a pubic symphysis. It's actually not itself a bone. It's a piece of ligamentous tissue that helps hold the bony pelvis together. Um, I'm going to give you lots of maybe fun facts that you may or may not be interested in, but um, this can actually separate during pregnancy, and it's very painful when it does. Um, um, uh, as you can imagine, if there's a big baby head here, then the, then the sacrum, uh, sorry, the pubic bone itself can separate at the pubic symphysis. Um, and then these are the um, ischium, and these are the ischial spines. So uh, if you ever go to a yoga class, um, they'll tell you to sit on your sits bones. They're referring to your um, ischial spines, and you can feel them if you touch your butt right where you're sitting. Um, so I think that that covers all the things I wanted to hear. Anything Question. to add? Yes. Is this a girl pelvis or a boy pelvis? Oh, yeah. Girl pelvis or boy pelvis? Girl. Why? How do you know? <laughs> so yes, in this class we would only show you a girl pelvis, but 
there is a difference. So, so we refer to pelvises uh, in different shapes. There's a gynecoid pelvis. Um, and Dr. Chen, help me out with the other names. There's the There's an android. Android. And with an anthropoid. An anthropoid. There we go, platypoid. <laughs> She knows these fun facts. I didn't read up on them. So actually, we spend a lot of time in obstetrics thinking about the shapes of pelvises because babies' heads have to go through these pelvises, and this is an evolutionarily conserved type of um, shape. Um, but because you know we're all made of lots of different DNA and genes, um, not every woman's pelvis is shaped in the gynecoid fashion, which means that sometimes babies are born face up instead of face down or head sideways, and that's all because they're just trying to maneuver a slightly abnormal, slightly different shaped pelvis. We won't call it abnormal. Um, but the gynecoid pelvis is the standard female pelvis. Um, and it also gives a lot of space. So I, I want to refer back to this later on as we talk about pelvic masses as they grow, because you can see you know, a, a male pelvis is more narrow. Um, and you're a good test taker because this is a female class. But um, a male pelvis is more narrow. Um, and as a mass grows, frequently it grows pretty big before it grows to become outside of the pelvis. Yes. So one of the reasons it's hard to find tumors early is that they're sitting deep in the pelvis. You don't really feel them. They're sitting way down here. And by the time it gets big enough to pop out beyond the pelvic rim, it's a pretty big mass. Um, and the other thing that I would point out, and we'll talk about this later, um, is that when you have an adequate pelvis, we talk about having space or room, it helps us surgically to be able to do more surgery, minimally invasive, laparoscopically, through the vagina. Mm -hmm. um, and when we have a pelvis that's too narrow or too tight, it actually becomes more challenging for us. Surgically, to do the surgery that we yes, do. that's exactly right. No, it's, these are, those are all good points. So, you know, we think about, um, uh, sometimes people wonder why gynecologic oncologists, and we spend all of our time thinking about cancer, why we come from the um, discipline of obstetrics and gynecology. But I think you can already hear how um, the uh, experience in obstetrics uh, informs a lot of what we do surgically. And um, so one way to think about this is when uh, we, we measure the uterus um, at 20 centimeters, it's at the belly button when a, when a baby is about 20 weeks size gestation. So um, it's at the pubic bone around 12 or 13 centimeters. And that's, as Dr. Chen was pointing out, a pretty good size uterus and baby already, but it's not really palpable abdominally. So that's the kind of the size and dimensions of a mass that you can hide in this bony pelvis. <laughs> Any questions before we move on about that? <clears throat> Okay, so um, this is a little bit of a busy slide. You do not have to um, memorize all of these um, words on here or even read them, but I'm gonna just point out. So this is a, um, uh, a person who has been halved uh, through the middle. So this is their pubic symphysis is gonna be right here. Oh, actually, sorry, right there, the pubic symphysis. Um, this is person's fatty tissue and skin. And then this is the spine and the sacrum sacral bone is right here. Um, so going from front to back, we have our urinary bladder with the urethra. And then here is the vagina with the uterus. And I'll point out that the word cervical, you know, we divide in, and, and it is very true, cervical cancer and uterine cancer are very different diseases and they behave very differently. Um, but a lot of times I think there's um, confusion amongst lay people that uh, about the uterus and the cervix, they're actually one organ. They're only really different. You're able to tell the difference between the cervix and the uterus microscopically. Um, and cervix means neck. So it really is referring to the opening or the neck of the uterus. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about the tissue types that are different in the cervix and in the uterus itself. Um, this is showing kind of over to the patient's right-hand side, the ovary and fallopian tube which um, you can't see the blood supply so well on that side um, that leads from the ovary to the uterus, but you can see some of the blood supply here. These are gonna be the gonadal arteries and veins, and I'll show you a different picture where you can see those a little bit better. Um, and then posterior to the uterus is the rectum, and the, uh, or we call it, um, uh, um, sig the sigmoid colon and rectum, thank you. Um, and then the anus is down here. So 
some things to point out, and if Dr. Chen wants to also take the mic to help point some things out, but um, while we have a lot of room in the pelvis, in general for masses, say from the ovary, to just sort of grow in here, and actually, you know, this is a, uh, these cartoons are always drawn a little bit out of proportion. The uterus is about the size of a fist, sits down way down deep uh, between the rectum and the bladder. Um, when this is compressed, the bladder almost entirely lays over the uterus. So the point that I wanted to make here is that there are certain things that we think about and that are worth thinking about anatomically with respect to where the cancer grows. So cancers of the uterus usually start in this lining here, which I will point out called the endometrium. So um, that will influence the way we the cancer itself presents. A cervical cancer grows here in the cervix, and you can see how close it is to the bladder and how close it is to the rectum. This is actually accurate how close these structures are, which means that the rectum and the bladder are oftentimes affected um, when the cancer gets to be a certain size. Um, and that has implications for treatment and for patient's um, quality of life and things like that. Whereas the ovary is kind of hanging off to the side, and while it certainly get, can get stuck on things like the uterus or the bladder or the rectum, it just has, uh, as we were pointing out before, a lot more space to grow before it's going to cause symptoms related to the bowel or to the bladder. Um, any questions about any of that right now? Okay. So here's our blood supply. So going back to pelvis, right? So now, remember I was showing you these big, those area, this is going to be the sacral promontory kind of right down here behind. So this is a, where those big blood vessels in our pelvis run. And those are called the external, uh, so the, excuse me, this is the common iliac artery and vein. This is the external iliac artery and vein. And then going here, kind of hidden a little bit, is the internal iliac artery and vein. So starting up higher, aorta, everybody right here in the middle of your belly, if you're slim enough or laying down flat, you can feel your aorta pulsating sometimes. Um, the vena cava, which is the largest vein in our body, lies just off to the right of it. Um, and so these are the major blood supply to the pelvis. And you'll see there's a few um, interesting things to point out in terms of how um, the ovaries themselves um, drain a little bit differently. Who can notice, I want you to look up in this region, who can tell me what's different about how the left ovary and the right ovary drain, um, uh, veins drain the pelvis? Can you see that difference? Anybody? One drains into the aorta, the other one drains into the renal artery. The renal vein, that's exactly right. So the left side, here, the blue vein drains into the left renal vein. That's exactly right. And the right vein drains into the vena cava. So just to remind you guys, remember arteries pump. This is the forward flow out of the blood, uh, out of the heart. The blood flows down this direction, goes into these tiny little vessels to feed the organ itself. Then the veins drain all of the waste um, and deoxygenated blood away from the um, organ itself. And then it goes in this direction back up to um, the, the liver, actually, and then uh, gets reoxygenated back into the heart, uh, reoxygenated through the lungs and back into the heart. Um, so the, that, that's why you'll you, a lot of times see in, um, in cartoons and things like that that the red is the oxygenated blood, that's our arteries, and the venous system is the deoxygenated blood coming away from the organ. In real life, it's all red. <laughs> blood is blood. Um, so then, just to drill down just a tiny bit more. So we have. Uh, I'm gonna. So I've. I pointed out to you aorta, common iliac artery, external iliac artery, internal iliac artery. Then coming from the aorta to feed the ovaries is the gonadal artery and vein. A gonadal is kind of the generic word for it. You can call it the ovarian artery and vein. Um, Men have testicles, women have ovaries, so if we're going to refer to it generic, generically, we call it the gonad artery, the gonadal artery. If we want to refer to it specifically related to female or male, we call it ovarian or testicular. Um, and then the last one to point out here is the uterine artery and vein, and that is actually a um, branch from this internal iliac artery. Uh, 
People always ask, when we're doing surgery, how many lymph nodes are you going to take out? And are you going to take all of the lymph nodes out? And questions such as these. So lymph nodes are not drawn in this picture, but lymph nodes travel with all of the arteries and veins in all of our body. Um, so as you can imagine, unless we're going to remove, um, the, the task of removing all of the lymph nodes in somebody's body would be impossible. So what we actually think about when we're thinking about lymph nodes, which can carry cancer cells to other parts of your body, um, lymph nodes, we think about removing them for the purposes of staging, which Dr. Chen will get into a little bit more what staging is in a few slides, but lymph nodes travel with the artery and vein that drains the organ. So, for example, when we're doing a uterine cancer staging, we're interested in the lymph nodes that are close to the uterus and that drain that organ. So we remove lymph nodes in the external iliac artery and vein underneath here, and um, the, uh, also close to the internal iliac artery, um, and then sometimes the ones very close to where the uterine artery itself drains. And we also, because of the ovarian artery, drains up into the aorta area, we also remove lymph nodes around the aorta and the vena cava. Um, so those are sort of the major lymph node drainage. Um, so our lymph nodes are kind of like our trash collectors or garbage collectors for the body, um, and they remove waste products from the, the organ. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, they can also remove tumor cells. So, um, and that can be one method that tumor cells use to metastasize or travel to other parts of your body. So in our cancer staging surgeries, we remove lymph nodes in order to detect whether or not cancer has started to move elsewhere in the body. Is that good? Yeah. All right. Um, okay, and then for our vulvar and vaginal cancers, we thought um, we sure couldn't leave out some of the anatomy of the external pelvis. Um, as uh, Dr. Chen was pointing out earlier, vulvar, vaginal, and cervical cancers are a lot of times treated the same. And the reason for that is because, or treated similarly, thought of similarly, and grouped together. The reason for that is because all three of those cancers are, for the large part, um, um, develop as a result of an HPV infection, human papilloma virus. And so HPV infection of the, let's see, where's my cervix? HPV infection of the cervix, and then also this vaginal tissue here, and then the vulvar tissue on the outside. Um, HPV infection can lead to a cancer, um, and we, we will teach you more about how that can happen. Um, but you can see how some of the vulvar and vaginal cancers are um, in some ways trickier to treat because there are very important um, structures involved for example, the urethra, um, and then just looking again, I'm sorry, I'm flipping back and forth, but I want you to kind of see it head on and then also see what it looks like sideways. The urethra and the vagina are in very close proximation, um, so someone's ability to urinate might be, very, uh, by, might be affected by the tumor that's growing inside of their vagina. Um, or similarly, sexual function can be affected uh, depending on if the clitoris is, a gland's clitoris is involved. Um, and then just our, um, our sort of sense of sexual selves can be affected by if you have a large tumor that's involving one of the labia and you have to do a large resection in order to get margins around that area, you know, suddenly someone's anatomy is, and it feels very different. Um, there are lots of small nerves and, um, and nerves more than anything are sort of affected in this um, uh, sensory organ of the skin on the outside. Um, and then these are some of the muscles that we think about. And this is, um, I, I wanted to show this picture only to give you a sense that um, one of the things that we think is pretty interesting about our specialty is there's this um, three-dimensional nature of the pelvis. Um, it really is kind of like this bowl, a uh, bony pelvis bowl that has a bunch of muscles that sit on the floor of it and all the organs travel through those muscles, all the organs and nerves. Um, so um, it's a very interesting place anatomically, uh, a lot different than, say, the bowel, which is more or less 2D, um, not sort of the same three-dimensional space. Um, so um, you can get a little bit of a sense of that three-dimensional bowl-type shape with the muscle structures that they're pointing out here. If you actually look at the bones, those muscles that she's showing you are kind of, if you take this pelvis that looks like this, 
and you turn it face on. Yeah. And then you can see the complexity of the pelvic floor muscles. So it's keep your eye on that pubic symphysis and then look at where the pubic symphysis is here and then look at where the pubic symphysis is here. Okay? So that gives you kind of a sense of that three-dimensional nature of the, of the pelvis. And the challenge of the surgery is when the tumor grows deep enough to actually reach or affect those muscles because then you're actually having the cancer invade through the pelvic floor, invade into tissue that we can't easily address through surgery. Yep. So we'll talk about surgery as an option, but sometimes we can't do surgery effectively um, because the anatomy in this area is challenging and limits the ability for us to do some of the resections that we want to do and still be able to preserve function and anatomy. Yep, that's right. So that's where, um, when we get into the discussion of treatment, where we'll talk a little bit about the role of radiation, which is actually a very important modality that we use for cervical, vaginal, and vulvar cancers for exactly this reason. It's a better way sometimes for large enough tumors to preserve function, bladder function, rectum uh, function to defecate um, uh, that otherwise we wouldn't be able to preserve if we had to surgically resect a big tumor. Okay, so this is a little bit of a test. This is now a real person's picture of um, a pelvis. And so um, I'm gonna just point to structures and maybe by, uh, someone show, raise a hand and tell me what you think that uh, I'm showing you. So we'll start with these here, white paired structures. Anyone have an idea? Ovaries, there we go, yes, <coughs> ovaries. So if we're looking, so this is laparoscopic surgery, just to kind of give you an orientation. Laparoscopic surgery means that we use a camera, it actually gives us a beautiful view of the pelvic structures. Um, the way we get that view is by um, uh, putting CO2 gas into the abdomen. Our abdomens are pretty distensible, so we can put several liters of CO2 gas into somebody's abdomen, inflate the abdomen, put them um, tilt them back so that the bowel retracts into their upper abdomen, and then with the camera, look at this picture. Um, and so we're looking at with the camera into somebody's abdomen towards their feet. So the, these are the ovaries. So then if these are the ovaries, then this guy here is uterus. That's exactly right. What kind of size is the ovary? Sorry? What kind of size? The, the ovary is about the size of a walnut? Mm, ovaries are about two, to, two and a half to three centimeters. Yeah. So walnut might be a little bit on the small side. It depends also if the woman is premenopausal or postmenopausal. Yes. The ovaries definitely get smaller after a woman goes through menopause. Yeah. And my, my, my eyeball tells me that these are premenopausal ovaries because it looks like somebody has ovulated right there recently. <laughs> um, OK, so since we're talking about ovaries, then these structures here are fallopian tubes. That's exactly right. Um, so then this structure kind of going down behind the uterus is colon. Did I hear colon? That's exactly right. Bowel. It's bowel. It's the colon. And then the rectum is kind of down a little bit further. And then behind the uterus right here, does anybody have any idea? It looks very flattened out. It's because it is flattened out. It's being drained. But what, what, what would we expect to find in that location? Bladder, that's exactly right, okay? Nice job, guys. So um, we're gonna take a closer look at just a couple of uh, anatomy of a couple of the structures that are very important um, to the cancer talks that we're gonna be giving. So um, let's just talk a little bit more about the anatomy of those normal ovaries up there. Now, this is not a normal ovary. That is cancer. That is um, when Dr. Chen and I go in and we are operating on, we're not, Sometimes we see a mass on the ovary, or sometimes they're benign. Uh, but if we go in and see this, we know that we're dealing with a cancer. Um, so there, this cartoon over here um, is a, a cartoon of the ovary. And, and there's, the, the ovaries are amazing organs. They um, have many different cell types. So I'm going to just go through a couple of the cell types so that we understand a little bit the types of ovarian cancers that can develop. Now, 
There's the surface epithelium, which is basically a single layer of cells that covers the top of the ovaries. And unbelievably, it's the surface epithelium that causes one of our um, most serious, otherwise known as serous, cancers. This is the, um, it's crazy to talk about ovarian cancer in garden variety, but in terms of ovarian cancers, the one that is the most common, the one that we encounter and think about the most, um, in terms of cancer, the serous ovarian cancer is our most common histology. So histology means cell type, what it looks like underneath the microscope. Um, then this surface epithelium can create other kinds of cancers as well, other than serous. They can create a cell type called mucinous, also called endometrioid. I'm going to stop here for one second and explain endometrioid, because you are going to hear us use the word endometrial in reference to uterine cancer. Endometrial is the lining of the uterus, and I'm going to point that out in a, in a slide in a minute. Endometrioid means endometrial-like, so it forms glands like the inside of the uterus does. So when the pathologists look at this endometrioid ovarian cancer underneath the microscope, it has some features that make them think that it looks like that endometrial-type tissue. Um, so just don't let that confuse you. There is an endometrioid ovarian cancer, and then there is an endometrioid endometrial cancer, okay? Um, and then there is a clear cell type of ovarian cancer and a transitional cell. So this, going back, this surface epithelium, this tiny little layer of cells that just covers the top of the ovary, this can f um, form any one of these five kinds of cancer, and the most common is, uh, and the one that people here who may have some familiarity with ovarian cancer, the serous ovarian cancer is the most common type. Young women, generally, get germ cell cancers. Um, and these behave very differently um, than our epithelial type cancers. So the germ cells are the cancer, are the cells that make our follicles and release the eggs. Um, or I should say that, uh, the, the, follo that hold, the follicles hold these germ cells, um, the egg cells. And so they have, as you might imagine, they can do very interesting things. Um, they form um, uh, lots, and diff lots of different kinds of cell types, dysgerminoma, yolk sac, embryonal, choriocarcinoma, teratoma. Teratoma is uh, generally benign, um, but it's uh, an interesting type of um, mass that we will operate on sometimes. And, um, because it's an egg cell, it can form anything from skin to bone, teeth, hair, fat cells. It has pluripotency, meaning it can really form any kind of cell type. Um, and then the last are the sex cord stromal tumors. So these are the, the stroma is the um, tissue that normally will help feed the germ cells and help support them as they're growing and maturing. Um, but when they become cancerous, they can form granulosa cell tumors, fibrom fibromas, which are actually benign, thecomas, Sertoli cell, Sertoli Leydig, and steroid cell tumors. Um, so we're not going to, I know this is a long list of strange cell types that you've probably never heard before, but the one to remember is serous ovarian cancer. It's the most common kind of ovarian cancer that we run into. Um, and it is, as the name, as we like to say, serous is serious. Any questions about any of that? Okay, so then as I promised, a closer look at the anatomy of the uterus. So the endometrium is a cell of, uh, a layer of cells that is the lining of the uterus. So normally when women have periods, that is the lining that builds up over the course of the menstrual cycle and then sheds at the end of the menstrual cycle. Um, and as we'll see, this endometrium is the, the lining of uterus is the area where most uterine cancers form, the most common kind of uterine cancer forms. And um, it will be relevant because it's one of the reasons we can diagnose uterine cancer much earlier than ovarian cancer, for example. Because what happens when you grow some abnormal cells here? Well, they bleed and people will have abnormal bleeding. They'll see their doctor and get a biopsy and we've diagnosed something at a very early stage. Um, but you can get cancers also in the myometrium. So the myometrium is the muscle of the uterus, and that's what um, 
stretches and contracts during, say, labor or when people talk about having menstrual cramps. That's a lot of times the, the muscle of the uterus is cramping. And so these are the muscle cells of the uterus. This can develop a cancer. It's called a sarcoma. They're very uncommon. And then the parametrium is um, the single cell, uh, a single layer of cells that actually overlies the uterus. Overlies, it's probably fair to say parametria. I never spell parametria that way, but <laughs> parametria is, um, uh, I, I call it when I explain it to patients, a saran wrap lining that covers all of your internal organs. It covers the bowel, covers the uterus, covers the ovaries covers the liver, all of the organs in your inside is covered with this single cell thin layer. Well, let's go back and look at our ovary. Remember this surface epithelium here? So that's the exact same type of cell type that is covering all of the rest of the organs in the body. So as we'll learn about, you'll learn about more when we talk more specifically about ovarian cancer. Ovarian cancer really encompasses three types of cancer from either the fallopian tube, the ovary, or the parametria. Peritoneum, sorry, I keep saying, <laughs> I'm, I'm like looking at this parametrium word. Uh, thank you, peritoneum. <laughs> peritoneum, which is, the, um, which is the cell layer that covers the, um, the internal organs in the body. So I've said it wrong a couple times. I apologize because it's labeled wrong on that, on that slide. Peritoneum is how, we, is how we say that. So a peritoneal cancer. Um, and that's because actually embryologically, when we're growing um, as single cell and then multiple cell and fetuses and embryos, um, that is um, uh, embryologically from the same cell type. Um, and then just because I don't think you got a great look of it on the other one, just to remind you, so the uterus, these are the fallopian tubes, so this is where the egg would travel down when, you're, um, when a woman is getting pregnant or when she ovulates. Um, and then um, the uh, um, suspensory ligament contains the um, ovarian artery and vein or the gonadal artery and vein. And then um, these are the uterine artery uh, and vein down here. Cervix vagina. Okay. Um, I think this is the last one before you, Dr. Chen. So um, a little quiz here. What structures can you identify? So now this is a real world specimen. This is going to be easy for you guys because you were able to identify it in the laparoscope. So these are ovaries. See what I said about the uterus? It's little. Yeah, uterus. And so this is the cervix. And as you can see, like by your eyeball, you wouldn't be able to say if the cervix stopped here or here or there. It's not uh, microscopically, you can tell. Um, but I did this to show you what a cervical cancer looks like. Um, so this is a, a little margin of vagina here, normal vagina, and this is as though someone has removed a cervix, uterus, and part of the vagina, and then they've turned it so that you can see it this way. So when we're looking with a speculum, for example, a speculum examination, um, the speculum goes right here, and that's what we, and if we see that, we know that we're looking at a cervical cancer. So those, so that's. Those scales are different. That's, those are in millimeters and those in centimeters? I think they're all in centimeters. I think they're all in centimeters. One, two, three, four, looks like to me. One, two, three, four, five. Just so. because it's a cancer? Oh. The cancer has expanded the cervix here. Oh, wow. Yeah, this is a normal cervix. Nothing wrong with that cervix. So the cancer's in the bulge Yes, exactly. This bulge right here. This is normal. This is vagina. So. Uh, when they talk about surgical staging or when they talk about surgery, probably in a couple weeks, we'll talk about how important it is to get margins around your cervical cancer. So whoever removed this cervical cancer was intent on making sure to get an appropriate vaginal margin um, in order to get all the way around that cervical cancer. Okay, Dr. Chen's going to finish up a couple more anatomy by imaging and staging. Yep. I think that to be able to continue talking about cancers as we have discussions about early stage disease or advanced stage disease, I want to give you some vocabulary to work with. We also will talk about grading tumors, so I want to show you that. Um, and some of the way that we look at tumors by imaging, I think is a nice segue from the section that Dr. Chapman showed us, because what we see here is an MRI scan. This is a CT scan. And this is a PET CT scan. And I think from the pictures that you've seen, the cartoons, the drawings of anatomy, 
I want to ask you, can you identify what we're looking at on each of these scans? Because the scans are helpful to be able to look at anatomy as we're making plans. So if we see someone with a uterine cancer, before we go to surgery, we may want to get an MRI. If we're concerned about a recurrence of ovarian cancer, we may want to get a PET CT. And it's really nice to see how real life anatomy maps to the pictures that we just saw from the textbooks. So this is, again, a sagittal view. So remember that picture of the patient, the, the person who was kind of cut down the center. Um, can you tell me what this is? This is the front of the patient. And this is the back of the patient. So remember what we started off with? What's this right here? The connector, yeah. the connector, right? So the connector of the pubic bone. So this is the pubic symphysis. And what I'll tell you is that things in MRI scans come out as different scales of gray based on the amount of fluid that's in it. This is a structure that's full of fluid. Wow. Yep. yep. Wow. And what sits behind the bladder we know that's the uterus, and you can see this structure here coming out. That's the rectum, and then this is the bone. You can see the vertebral bodies here of the sacrum and down to the coccyx. So when we're looking at an MRI scan, we're looking at a whole bunch of different views. They get hundreds of views, um, but this is a good illustration of how we would look at a cross-section of an MRI. Uh, we can see the lining of the uterus very well. The cervix is down here, and if you see something that's growing here and growing into that black tissue that's not normal, that sometimes is how we would see a cervical cancer. So an MRI is good at looking at invasion. It's good at looking at invasion into the uterus, invasion into the cervix, and in other views, we can see if there's nodules or masses, and we can actually see the ovaries pretty well on an MRI too. This picture down here is a CAT scan. Um, a CAT scan um, is an axial view of the patient, so it's kind of taking the patient like a loaf of bread um, and cutting them this way. And so depending on how that uterus is tipped, sometimes we get a good view of the uterus on an axial scan as well. So can anybody tell me which structure is the uterus on this picture? Not this, not this. What do you think? This, right. And this kind of shows like the uterus here, and it's got that little pear shape, and it's got the little endometrial cavity. So this uterus is tipped in a way that on the axial scan, we can see it pretty well. Um, a CAT scan does use x-ray technology as opposed to an MRI scan that uses magnetic technology. A CT scan is really good at looking at soft tissue. Um, and a CT scan also, we will give contrast, the radiologist will give an iodine-based contrast that depending on the timing of the contrast and how it perfuses the tissue, will do what we call enhancing. And that enhancement helps us to look and see, does tissue look abnormal or does it look normal? And that frequently helps us look for where there might be areas of disease growing. The CAT scan, you can see, isn't as clear as the MRI in terms of showing the uterine lining, but it gives us a good view of the rest of the pelvis um, through a lot more images. Now, this little thing here, that's the ovary. That's actually a cyst that we can see on the ovary um, that's sitting right next to the uterus. And then when we talk about the pelvic sidewall, we're talking about this area here. Think again about that bony pelvis that Dr. Chapman showed you. The vessels kind of run down those sides on either side. And so when we're doing a CAT scan and we're looking for lymph nodes, these can be areas that we can find lymph nodes on the pelvic sidewall. We look to see if we see the ureters. The ureters are the tubes that connect the kidneys down to the bladder. And if there's a tumor in the cervix or in the uterus, sometimes that can push on those ureters and cause them to be dilated. Okay, what are we looking at here? This is a PET CT, and a PET CT is using a radio-labeled glucose molecule in addition to CAT scan technology. So you'll have a CAT scan, you'll have the IV contrast, and then we'll use something called FDG. And FDG goes to where there's metabolic activity. So actually, if you look at a PET CT of a whole body, the brain is completely bright because your brain is using sugar all the time um, to be able to do its work. So that's not what we're looking at when we get a PET CT, but we're looking to see, is there other metabolic activity other, in other places in the body? Um, it's also excreted through the kidneys, out the bladder. So you can see here 
The bladder's bright, but not because there's a cancer down here, but because that's where the FTG is getting eliminated and we're catching a picture where there's already FTG that's being excreted um, into the bladder. So what do we see? And the radiologist will tell you there's a positive arrow sign. What are we looking at? Yeah. So we're looking to see are there areas that are metabolically active, um, and we're looking to correlate that with the CAT scan. So sometimes we'll see metabolic activity. You'll actually, if you happen to catch an injection site, um, you can see metabolic activity because that's where the FTG got shot in. Um, you'll see where FTG accumulates, but if FTG is accumulating in an area where there is a mass that we can see on the CAT scan, that raises our concern about a metabolically active lesion representing cancer. Sometimes we'll talk about lesions that we can see that are not metabolically active, and those can represent growths that are not cancerous. They can sometimes be cancers that we've treated with radiation or chemotherapy, and the lump doesn't always go away, um, but the metabolic activity does, and that's a sign that the cancer is responding as well. Um, but PET-CTs are a scan that we frequently will use in ovarian cancer and sometimes in cervical cancer to follow treatment. The latest imaging is actually PET MRI technology, where they take an MRI picture and match it with a PET scan, um, and you can get some really nice images. Um, and the images are helpful because we're trying to establish the extent of disease. Is there active disease? If we saw one spot of disease, we sometimes think about surgery as an option. Again, we're always talking about what treatment choices we have. When we see multiple places, if there's four spots, we might say that there's too many spots to really be able to excise successfully with surgery, and so chemotherapy might be a better strategy to use to think about this tumor. Um, so this is kind of imaging as it matches some of the anatomy that you've seen. Um, and then we'll talk about how imaging is also used in helping us do staging. So staging is usually done through a combination of physical examination. Um, Dr. Chapman mentioned putting in a speculum. You see a lesion on the cervix. That cervical cancer is at least a 1B because we can see it. We can do an examination and feel if that cancer is spreading. Um, so we can feel, has it expanded the cervix into the parametrium, that tissue around the cervix? Is it involving the vagina? Um, when we do a physical exam, and we can feel that there's a lymph node up in the neck area. That's distant disease, um, and that would be considered stage four disease. When we talk about staging and grading, I think this is an important um, term that I want to make sure is clear, and I'll clarify if there's questions. Staging talks about anatomically, physically, how far the cancer has gone. So this is an example of staging of uterine cancer. So we have cancer that's stage one, that's in the lining. Um, a 1A is where it's not growing deeply in, into the lining. Um, 1B and 1C are when it's growing more deeper into the wall of the uterus. Um, a 2A is when it's involving the cervix, or a stage two is when it's involving the cervix. A stage three is when it's grown through the uterus or it's involving the ovaries and tubes. And a 3B is when it's also involving the vagina. Each cancer has a different staging. And we basically stage tumors based on knowing its biology. Um, in studies looking at hundreds of women with uterine cancer, we know that people who have disease that spread to the ovary have a worse outcome than when the cancer is limited to the uterus. We know that there's a difference when the cancer is growing deeply into the wall of the uterus compared to when it's growing only superficially into the wall of the uterus. We know that when cancer has spread into the lymph nodes, it's more extensive than it's confined to the ovary. And so with uterine cancer, we think about all of those factors for staging. For cervical cancer, we know that the stage can progress more by expansion um, and that it spreads into the lymph nodes but that it usually is local regional and it's spread much for a much longer amount of time than say uterine cancer or ovarian cancer. In ovarian cancer, we think about the disease as possibly spreading locally, but the ovary is already in the abdominal cavity. So one of the things that those cells can do is that they can shed. Um, and when ovarian cancer cells shed into the abdominal cavity, 
places it can go to are the uterus or the pelvic organs, but it can also go to the omentum, which is a fat pad that sits in the upper abdomen, um, and it can go into the lymph nodes. So as we talk about the patterns of spread, we talk about staging. So when we talk about stage three ovarian cancer, which is the most common stage of ovarian cancer that we see, that's an ovarian cancer that's already either spread into the upper abdomen or into the lymph nodes. Um, and so we know some of this staging by our examination and imaging, and we know some of our staging through surgery. So if we are concerned about a big mass and we wanna figure out what we need to plan for as we're going to surgery, we will get a scan. And on that scan, we might see enlarged lymph nodes. And the thing to keep in mind about scans is that lymph nodes can be enlarged from inflammation, from infection, but there are certain ways that cancer lymph nodes can look. A small lymph node, you can't tell. Um, you can potentially tell if you do a PET CT, but a small lymph node might just show up on a scan because it's a normal lymph node that's a little bit inflamed and it's a little bit bigger than a normal lymph node size, but is still a benign lymph node. So when we do surgery, what we're doing is we're sampling those lymph nodes that are at risk, and we showed you through anatomy that the lymph nodes in the pelvis and the aortic area are all areas that lymph nodes can spread to. We're looking in the abdominal cavity because we're looking to see, is there any involvement of the omentum? We feel or look up to the diaphragm and along the surface of the liver, and we do a thorough evaluation to really see, is there any sign of spread? Staging is critical because knowing how extensive a cancer is helps us think about prognosis. A cancer that's more advanced has a worse prognosis, and so we wanna be more aggressive in our treatment, either surgically or medically, for treating a more advanced stage cancer. Um, but on the flip side, an early stage cancer that we've identified as being at less risk, we may be able to give less treatment for, less chemotherapy, less neuropathy, um, less radiation, less bowel toxicity. And so staging really helps us to refine that. Um, you know, if someone cannot have surgery, we do our best at clinical staging. But you'll see us talk about ovarian cancer and uterine cancer and the role of imaging and surgery in thinking about staging. Questions? Yeah. When you're talking about uh, doing a physical exam, being able to feel it, are you feeling a, a lump or what exactly mm -hmm. are you looking for? So it, it depends on the type of cancer, um, but we're feeling for a lump. We're feeling if there's any obvious spread in, in proximity. So you know we're feeling for the size of the uterus. If the cervix is large, like in that picture of that cervical tumor, we're feeling, does it feel like it's mobile? You know, we talked about the anatomy. You know, does the tissue around the cervix feel like it's also invaded or infiltrated with tumor? Or if it feels like it's free, then that would, a free t if it's confined to the cervix, we would call it stage one. Um, but we're looking also on physical exam to see, are there any lymph nodes in the groin area? Are there any lymph nodes in the neck? We listen to hear if there's any fluid in the lung. We push on the abdomen to feel if there are any tumor masses or lumps um, or concern for uh, spread into the abdominal cavity. If we are concerned, we have the privilege of having imaging, so we have the technology that we can then use to scan and confirm it. But for example, in um, East Africa, where they don't have some of these technologies for cervical cancer, they have to do their staging by physical examination. And so cervical cancer, we actually cl clinically stage, meaning by examination, and don't use as much imaging. But for ovary and uterus, we use imaging and we use surgery. Yeah, in the back. Going back to the scans, um, um, I hear certain programs being used mm -hmm. sort of as a early, early sort of monitoring. Mm -hmm. So, but what? So, what is seen on a sonogram? An ultrasound is using sound waves, and it's bouncing against the ovary. Let's say. Um, and the ultrasound is great at looking at the ovary for looking at cysts, um, for looking at follicles, for looking at anything that looks irregular um, and that would be suspicious. So frequently, if it's an ovarian mass that we're concerned about and it's a young woman, we're thinking that this is likely benign, um, an, an ultrasound is a great test to be able to get. 
When we're discussing staging of cancer, the ultrasound is more limited because we don't get the lymph nodes and the rest of the abdominal cavity as well. But if we're trying to distinguish, is this cyst on the ovary looks something that looks functional, normal, part of the usual activity of the ovary, you know, the ovary will make follicles. You know, Dr. Chapman showed you, um, you know, the eggs. Eggs get released every month in an ovulating woman. So you'll see naturally that there'll be cysts that come and go. And those aren't things that we need to be worried about. The ultrasound's great at looking at those types of structures. Uh, in an older woman, uh, seeing a structure like that, in an older woman, it would depend on what the structure looked like. If it, and we talk about simple and complex at that point. Um, and when we talk about early detection and prevention, we'll talk a little bit about this. But when we see a cyst on the ovary, we describe it as being simple. Um, we describe it as being complex. Complex can mean that there's nodularity in the wall. We call that mural nodularity. We can see nodules on the surface of the ovary. We call that surface excrescences. We talk about seeing kind of walls inside the ovary, so a more complex cyst, we call that septations. Those would be more concerning um, and either, in either an older or a younger woman. But if an older woman had just a simple cyst, it wasn't very big, and even if it is somewhat big, as long as it looks simple and it's not changing, that's still more likely going to be benign. Somebody else? Yes. What is stage three of very 3C of cancer. What are the letters in cancer? Is that sort of so in each cancer, there's a staging system of you know one, two, three, and four. Is to, the question is how do we stage? Um, and there's numbers which are the Roman numerals of one, two, three, and four. In general, stage one is confined to the organ of origin. So a stage one ovarian cancer is confined to the ovary. A stage one uterine cancer is just in the uterus. A stage one cervical cancer is just in the cervix, although it might be growing into the wall of the uterus, or it might be pushing the cervix so that now the cervix is big as opposed to a small cervix. Um, but stage one means confined to the organ. Um, two, three, and four is kind of progressively how the cancer becomes more extensive. And the A, B, and Cs is the subcategories of distinction that we've learned by understanding pathology. So in ovarian cancer, for example, there's 3A, 3B, and 3C. Um, when cancer has spread to the omentum and it's microscopic, that's 3A. When cancer has spread to the omentum and it's a centimeter in size, or less than two centimeters, that's a 3B cancer. If cancer has spread to the omentum, but it's a large mass, it's more than two centimeters, it's a lump, um, then that's a 3C ovarian cancer. And when cancer has spread into the lymph nodes, it's also a 3C ovarian cancer. And people have done studies looking at, you know, is 3C lymph node disease different than 3C omental disease? And it probably is, but by the time you've gotten something that's spread that far, they're kind of grouped together. And so the, the other reason that staging is important is it helps us to group patients together as we talk about management. So, you know, if somebody had uterine cancer, we talk about personalizing medical care. Um, and we certainly want to do that, but we have to be able to have some idea of cancer that's spread into the lymph nodes. We probably want to manage them all in a similar way. So if we said we have a 3C ovary cancer and we're all going to manage them in this particular way, it allows us to be able to talk about groups of patients um, with a language that we can share. It helps us to be able to look at studies. It helps us to be able to look at outcomes um, if we can have the same language and classification system. So staging is a form of classification, and the numbers and the letters are different subcategories in the classification. Anything else you want to add, Dr. Chapman? OK. Yes? Is peritoneal cancer primarily a colon type of cancer, or does it involve different organs? Is that just a risk? A peritoneal cancer starts from the lining of the abdomen, and when we talk about ovarian cancer, we'll show you kind of why ovarian and peritoneal cancer are the same type of cancer. Okay. Um, they're more common than we thought. So the things that we used to call ovarian cancer, a lot of them are tubal, and a lot of them are peritoneal. Yeah. In the back. Can ovarian cancer spread to the lungs? Ovarian cancer can spread, the question is, can ovarian cancer spread to the lungs? And it can. It depends on where the cells go. And if they migrate into the abdominal cavity, they can go through the diaphragm and end up in the pleural cavity. Um, they can also go through the bloodstream and end up in the lungs um, that way as well. Yes. 
A leiomyosarcoma is a cancer of a muscle wall of the uterus, but most of the uterine cancers we see start from the lining, not from the muscle wall. This is a very, very deadly cancer, right? It's a deadly cancer because it's aggressive, but it's also a very rare cancer. Rare cancer. Rare cancer. Mm -hmm. so it's easy to treat, but there's no way to treat. Uh, it's challenging to treat, and we're not talking a lot about leiomyosarcoma, but we can answer some of those questions afterwards. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna move on so we can talk a little bit about grading a cancer. Um, so when we talk about grading, um, we actually don't use letter grades, A, B, C, or D, but we talk about high grade and low grade. Um, we sometimes will talk about histologies as well as the grading. So Dr. Chapman mentioned mucinous or clear cell or serous. Um, and what we're looking at here on this cartoon is in the top here, we see the different types of histologies. You know, so now we're kind of seeing that there's different patterns. And you know, the question is, what is the difference between clear cell and serous? And from the back, you can say, well, it all looks kind of like purple blotches. But the pathologists actually look at this under the microscope, <laughs> and they can look at patterns. And pathologists are really trained at looking at patterns and different patterns of structure. It's like, I think of it as looking at wallpaper. Um, but, <laughs> but different structures and patterns help them be able to distinguish the type of cancer. We also know that different types of cancer have different behaviors. Some are more aggressive, high grade, and some are less aggressive, low grade. Um, and so low-grade tumors are slower growing. Um, they're more likely to grow through a stepwise pattern, whereas high-grade cancers have more potentially have more mutations and evolve quickly and can spread quickly before they've actually grown very large in their site of origin. Um, we talk about clear cell, serous, carcinosarcoma. These are histologies that are all high-grade type of histologies. And so as we talk about ovarian cancer, the more common type of ovarian cancer we're going to address is a high-grade serous ovarian carcinoma. Um, I don't expect us to go through all of this, but thinking about what gets involved in a pathology report. Um, and in reading a pathology report, just to hit the highlights, um, the pathology diagnosis, everything that we take out, the pathologist will cut, put into a cassette, look under a microscope, um, and give us a diagnosis. Uh, when they look and give us that diagnosis, they'll tell us, you know, we took a biopsy. It showed high-grade serous cancer. We took out the uterus, both the tubes, the ovaries, and on the hysterectomy, this shows that there's high-grade serous carcinoma involving the fallopian tube, involving the left ovary. The right side happens to be benign. We took other biopsies from other areas in the omentum, another biopsy by the colon, and those showed metastatic high-grade serous carcinoma. We talk about taking out lymph nodes, and we don't always take out lymph nodes one by one. We take out a fat pad that has the lymph nodes in them. Um, and what that tells us is, are there cancer cells in the lymph node? And in this case, there were multiple lymph nodes that we removed that were negative, but here's one lymph node, two lymph nodes that show that there is cancer that spread into the lymph node of this patient with ovarian cancer. So that one lymph node makes this lady a stage three ovarian cancer. Her diagnosis, however, comes from the fallopian tube. So even though I said she has an ovarian cancer, she actually gets diagnosed with a fallopian tube cancer. And the pathologist will do a synoptic. So there's, there's a template that the pathologists are, re are now required to do from um, anatomic pathology, where they'll give a comment about where the cancer starts from, the type of cancer, serous, um, the grade of the cancer, high grade, how big is the cancer, two centimeters, is there lymphatic involvement? Yes. Um, where is there spread? And they talk about the peritoneal biopsies. Are there lymph nodes that are positive? In the pelvis, yes. In the aortic area, no. And putting all of that together, they come up with a diagnosis of a 3C ovarian cancer. So when we say, bring your pathology report, these are the things that we're looking for. Sometimes the pathologist will do some immunostains. Um, and immunostains are a pathologist's way of molecularly being able to characterize the tumor
so that they can discuss kind of what type of cancer this may be. And there's usually a checklist of all the things that were taken out. So you wanna make sure that if you have staging, we go and make sure that all the parts that were supposed to get removed got removed for the stage. All right, what causes cancer? Thank you. I was um, just going back one quickly here, just to, um, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping maybe this uh, slightly larger discussion about immunostains will sort of um, be a good segue actually into some of the discussion points about the biology of cancer. So um, immunostains are um, a pathologist's way of helping to define the organ of origin. As you might imagine, you can, um, the, presuming this is Dr. Chen's surgery, which I think it probably is, um, you, she removed cancer from a lot of different places and um, uh, ovary, uh, fallopian tube, so near the colon, near the omentum. And so you might ask, how are you sure this cancer started in the fallopian tube? Well, one of the ways that we're sure is through this combination of immunostains. So what that means, practically speaking, is going back to these slides. So these are unstained slides, or maybe just H and E, where they um, help um, identify the cells that have more or less glucose in them. It's a pretty standard initial pathology way of looking at tissue. But then they can also stain for additional kind of proteins, proteins that are displayed on the cell surface. And depending on where your tissue started, the organ of origin, uh, that will help um, the pathologist determine whether or not it makes sense for an ovarian cancer, for example, to have P53 positive. Yes, that totally makes sense. It might not make so much sense if this was a brain cancer or a colon cancer or some, something else. So they use this combination of markers where they're looking at the cell surface to help them be sure that this is a cancer that started in a fallopian tube and not from any of the other organs that were removed during the, the surgery. So um, this is going to bring us to a, a discussion about what causes cancer. There's a great book. Um, it will take you the better part of a month to read if you started now and finished in a month um, called um, The Hallmarks of Cancer. It's written by this guy, Dr. Weinberg. And um, there's actually, um, if you go online and, and search the hallmarks of, can of cancer, you can find reviews that have kind of boiled down the, the six hallmarks of cancer. And it was a, almost 15 years ago now, I think, that this guy came up with these sort of six hallmarks of cancer. And then he has since updated it to include two additional ones. But when we're thinking about cancer, what we're thinking about is cells that have found a way to break the rules. And what rules do they need to break? What biologic rules do they need to break in order to do the things that cancer needs to do? Cancer needs to be able to metastasize. It has to be able to live on its own. It has to be able to um, evade the signals of the body that are telling it to stop growing. Um, so that's, um, we're gonna address each of these six things briefly. I promise I'm not gonna make you crazy with this. Um, but I think it gives a good context to how um, to our overview here in terms of the biology of cancer and how our um, cancer treatments actually work to interrupt some of these things that cancers have figured out a way to um, uh, oh, oh, figured out a way around the rules. So, so starting with evading apoptosis. So apoptosis, um, the best way to think about that is cellular death, cell death, and. Um, one, apoptosis is actually a really important um, thing that our bodies can do. For example, our hands, um, they start out as being webbed. And when you were in utero, the cells in between our fingers, our digits, those cells die. And they die through a programmed cell death called apoptosis. Um, apoptosis also functions in our body when the DNA has become very damaged. For example, in the sun, um, if you've gotten damaged skin from a sunburn, um, those cells die off before those mutations can cause a cancer. Um, and so it's your, cell, your body's way of helping to um, kill off cells that are problematic in one way or another. So unfixable DNA damage causes apoptosis. That's what we want to happen. And so then our cancer risk is decreased. But if you have unfixable DNA damage, and the cell has figured out a way to evade the signal to commit suicide, 
then the cell continues to divide, and now it's got all of these um, bad mutations in its DNA. And those can be carried through. Those mutations that are not beneficial to you can be carried through to future, cell, future um, daughter cells of this abnormal cell here. So that's the idea of apoptosis. Um, these two kind of go together, insensitivity to anti-growth signals and self-sufficiency in growth signals. So um, our cells respond to their neighbors. Um, and so, um, for example, let's use the um, example of uterine cancer. Um, if you, st uh, the, let's think about the, the, the normal menstruating woman. She has her cell lining of the uterus built up each month and then it sloughs off and those cells are, um, are released during her menstrual cycle. Um, that all happens in response to estrogen and progesterone fluctuations. Well, in a situation, and, and those are growth signals, right? Estrogen, progesterone, those are, are growth signals for the uterine cavity, for the uterine lining. And if a embryo happens to implant, then those growth signals help the uterine lining stay healthy to help support an early pregnancy. Well, in a situation where estrogen is dysregulated for a number of reasons, um, the most common of which actually in, in our society is obesity, um, oh, and we'll explain more how that works, but obesity can cause estrogen levels to be much higher. And so instead of sloughing those cells off, those cells now in the uterine cavity are just receiving constant growth signals. And if those cells lose their ability to respond properly to growth factors. Um, growth, normally in normal cells, growth factors should cause cells to divide, or if there aren't any growth factors, there shouldn't be any division. But if cells start dividing, regardless of whether the growth factors are there or not, now they've found a way to break a rule, um, a very important rule. So um, that's one of the things that happens as the second step, the estrogen can cause those cells to start dividing and dividing and proliferating. But what actually turns it into a cancer is when the cells have figured out how to grow and divide in the absence of that hormone stimulation. Okay? So that's number two and three. Number four, sustained angiogenesis. This was a really important um, um, discovery about 20 years ago. There's a guy at Harvard, Dr. Folk. Um, who um, is the father of angiogenesis, and actually it has now become a, um, uh, a target for a drug that we use in uh, ovarian cancer called, uh, actually uterine cancer as well, and cervical cancer. So angiogenesis means growing blood vessels. And so as you can imagine, cancers are hungry. We talked about how on the PET-CT, they um, take up that glucose, that labeled glucose, why cancers are hungry. They need, to, they need to feed themselves in order to survive. And so it's not enough for a ball of cells to divide. They actually have to grow their own blood supply in order to be able to get the glucose and the, the nutrients that they need in order to survive. So this cartoon here sort of explains how that actually happens. It's a multi-step process. The tumor volume reaches a certain um, a certain level, a certain burden of cells, and then they start secreting, if, if they're successful, if they have gotten the right mutations and, the, um, and developed uh, this capacity for sustained angiogenesis, they start secreting these growth factors that tell the nearby blood vessel to, um, start, uh, creating, um, to start creating these endothelial lining that starts actually extending away from the original blood vessel to provide them with their own little special blood vessel offshoot. And so then this blood vessel now can feed the ball of cells and it is able to get bigger. We have a question in the back, yes? So that ball of cells just became cooperative? Yes, so uh, the ball of cells became cooperative is what he said. Yeah, meaning that these guys figured out a way to work together. Yep. Yes, that's exactly right, that's exactly right. Um, so um, he's getting to the point, to, to an important point here is that the cells have to be able to signal and talk to each other. And actually that's not a terribly hard thing for our cells to do because our body cells have to do that all the time. But um, it brings up an important point that cancer has to evade in 
a very um, specific way, meaning that it can't just become this incredibly disorganized, mutated bunch of cells because then it will break machinery that it needs um, in order to do normal cellular functions. So um, it's one of the interesting problems in cancer that if you have a cell that is very, very highly mutated, it's probably broken too many important survival functions for it to actually become cancerous. But there are some kind of cancers that have figured out ways to become very highly mutated um, and also survive. And some of our gynecologic cancers are in that category. Okay, so that's angiogenesis. So just to recap, a uh, ball of cells reaches a certain critical level. It starts sending signals to nearby blood vessels. Those nearby blood vessels actually create little offshoots and a scaffolding for it to have its own blood supply. And that complicated process is called angiogenesis. And then our last, is this our last one? Second. No, second to last, thank you. <laughs> so um, limitless replicative potential. So. Um, I have put up a picture here of a really great book. I know we've given you um, some ideas for other homework, and I've already told you it'll take you a month to read the hallmarks of, of cancer. But um, if you want a lighter read, a much more fun read, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks is a, is a fantastic book. Um, it, it is about this woman, Henrietta Lacks, and um, you'll see here on the cover, Gila. Um, she is the source of HeLa cells, and HeLa cells were the first immortalized cells um, that were kept alive in a laboratory and tissue culture. And in fact, these HeLa they came from her cervical cancer. And in fact, these HeLa cells are used in laboratories all over the world now. Um, and so it originated from this woman, and her story is pretty fascinating. But um, to just drill down a little bit on limitless replicative potential, so most cells in our body undergo a fixed number of cell cycles. There, it's actually called the Hayflack limit, and it's somewhere between 40 and 60 divisions. And the reason there is this limit is, um, without getting too much into the problems of DNA replication, basically every time you re replicate the DNA, the very end of the DNA, um, if you did not have a protective barrier at the end of your DNA, it would shorten just a little bit because the template is not exactly, uh, the, the, t the, the, the way DNA replication works means that each time you would lose just a little bit off the tail of your DNA. In order to, for our cells to protect from that, they put a cap on the DNA, a bunch of sort of meaningless um, uh, 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 molecules called nu nucleotides, and the structure itself is called a telomere. So every time, so now every time your cell divides, the telomere shortens, and nobody cares because that's junk DNA. But there's a limit to that, and so they've figured out based on looking at um, the average cell's length of the telomere about how many divisions it can do before the DNA starts to de degrade, and that number is somewhere between 45, 40, and 60. Well, cells um, that have become cancerous have figured out a way to basically make their telomeres longer and longer, and they keep repairing the telomeres and repairing the telomeres. So they have lost now the, um, the, the, the cancer cells have lost that check, that 40 to 60 division checkpoint that says, after this point, you just have to die, and a new stem cell will come and take your place. Um, so this is called immortalization of the cell. Um, and um, that's one of the things that uh, HeLa cells did, uh, that, that her HeLa cells did, is they have an enzyme that just continues to replete the telomeres so that the DNA never degrades. Okay, and the last hallmark of cancer is tissue invasion and metastasis. So um, this is a, a cartoon of how, um, this is um, how it happens in a lot of kind of cancers. Um, but I would say the one that we have the best evidence for it working specifically in this way is especially with cervical cancer. Um, so uh, cell develops a mutation, and this mutation probably develops because the H, in cervical cancer anyways, the HPV virus introduces that mutation. And so um, the cell gets its mutation, and it doesn't already suddenly have all, set, all eight of the hallmarks it needs for cancer, it starts growing a little bit. And in the process of its growing, it probably accumulates some of the additional functions that it needs to gain um, in order to become cancer. Probably learns, grows a few extra blood vessels, learns angiogenesis, things like that. 
So dysplasia, hyperplasia and dysplasia are our precancerous lesions. They're not quite cancer yet. They have developed probably some of the hallmarks of cancer, but they have not uh, developed the ability to, uh, all of the abilities. Then this is an in situ cancer. And if you take a bunch of these cells and a bunch of these cells for our invasive cancer, you look at them under the microscope, they look for all intents and purposes the same. Um, and probably the very last step is uh, for the invasive cancer is to be able to actually um, grow through, break down some of the matrix of the tissue around it, and um, um, and and then find its blood vessel and and um, and begin its angiogenesis program. So this tissue invasion and metastasis, you cannot be a cancer without uh, learning, without being able to grow beyond your organ of origin. Even though we find in a stage one cancer that has as limited to its organ, that does not mean um, that it is not a cancer. It has learned to invade in the, uh, in the tissues in the organ itself, and it just has not yet, we've caught it before it has actually metastasized and gone elsewhere in the body. So is metastasis kind of aligned to stage four? So, uh, is metastasized aligned to stage four is the question. Um, yes, yeah, so meta stage four cancers are definitely metastatic. Um, Stage three cancers and certain types of cancer, for example, in ovarian cancer, we were speaking about how lymph node involvement or omental involvement is considered a stage three. Those are also metastases. Um, but um, but it, it, it is a little bit of a subtle point in cervical cancer where cervical cancer tends to spread locally and invade structures around it before it metastasizes. You can have a stage three cervical cancer that is not actually metastatic. It is just pressing on the tissues around it, and it hasn't actually moved into, say, the lymph nodes or into the upper abdomen. It is still belonging to the organ, uh, organ of origin and is just causing problems because of its size and its invasion into adjacent structures. Yes? Can you have a stage three cancer without it spreading to the lymph nodes? Yes, definitely. Um, one example was the ovary cancer. The ovary cancer that has spread, say, to the omentum and has made a, a two centimeter tumor in that omental tissue in the upper abdomen. Um, we oftentimes, during those cases, also sample the lymph nodes and find that they are uninvolved. Um, same thing with the example with the cervical cancer I just gave. You can have a stage three cervical cancer that doesn't actually involve the lymph nodes. Yes? Looking at this picture again, when you said that for HPV, that is what could cause a cell mutation and that hyperplasia and dysplasia wouldn't be considered uh, cancer? cancer? Correct. At that point, can you, is there a way to tell and at that point do you just do nothing and watch? It's a great question, um, and you will get a much more complete answer when we talk about um, cancer prevention, because um, cervical cancer is our best opportunity right now for prevention. Um, the question was, so we start out with this, in cervical cancer, we start out with this cell, and then we have these hyperplasia or dysplasia or precancerous lesions. Um, what do we do about them? Well, in the case of cervical cancer, those can be seen in a process in a procedure called colposcopy, which is basically microscopic examination of the cervix that's done in the office. And when we see lesions like this, precancerous lesions, we can excise them. And actually, excision of the tissue um, with the tumor, with the mutation in it, is sufficient to treat that and to prevent it from becoming an invasive cancer. So that's why. We, um, like I said, it's our best opportunity. Cervical cancer is our best opportunity for prevention because we do have this opportunity um, in the majority of cervical cancers to see it and remove it when it's only precancerous. Yes? Can you have a cervical cancer with HPV negative? Yes, it's a good question. We basically say about 98 per 98, 99% of cervical cancers are HPV related. But there are a few cell types that um, um, uh, there's a, something called a clear cell, I mean, sorry, a neuroendocrine um, cervical cancer, for example, that is not HPV related. So they're pretty rare cell types, but the majority of cervical cancer is thought to be HPV related. And in most cervical cancers, we do indeed find evidence of that HPV virus. <laughs> 
One more question. Yeah. If you have an invasive cancer, are you less likely to do surgery because the surgery might actually spread the, the cancer? Yeah, it's a very common question. And I'd also be interested to hear uh, Dr. Chen's way that she is explaining it. But as we've talked about, the, the problem with cancer is a biological one. So the cancer has already figured out a way to break these rules. Um, the surgery, surgical knife is not going to influence that one way or another. Um, but it is something that we do think about in terms of um, appropriate treatment for a cancer. For example, a lot of times we don't offer, we do not recommend surgery for a cervical cancer because we can't remove it without either causing severe damage to structures nearby or without cutting through the cancer itself. Um, so to briefly answer your, answer your question, um, cutting through a cancer is not ideal, but it probably doesn't cause it to spread. It's just not the best way to treat the cancer. Okay.